My grandparents supported themselves by renting what we called camps, and they had five very campy little buildings, very small buildings scattered around uh, several acres of land near their house, and those they rented summers, and that's how they financed their life here. The camps are all different. She got them all from different places. Aunt Ella, my Aunt Ella, who um, she had been born in that house, grown up there, married, moved away, brought her husband back there, retired in that house. She had married well, and he had money enough, so they bought a few camps. One camp was a uh, fishing shack from No Man's Land, which had been brought over from Nomans and beached at Scribnacket and people would go and buy them and she bought one and had cool. had it set up in one area of the land she owned. And then she bought a kit. Uh, it was one of the first, you know, kind of kit houses that you could buy. And it made a cute little camp. These camps are basic wooden frames with maybe two or three rooms. Uh, you know, nothing special, but people were happy to rent them. And they all had outhouses, and they all had to carry water from the same spring. But they never stopped them. They came every year and yeah. stayed. Could probably get about $500 for the summer. Uh, summer would be uh, Memorial Day to Labor Day. Did you get to know the people that would stay Oh, there? yes, yeah. intimately, yes. The same people came back year after year. They were, uh, we had New York school teachers, and um, they took three of the cottages. The other two, well, when I was remembering, there were four camps. Actually, there were five, but uh, early on, she sold one to Tom Benton. They're all interesting and different, and... Uh, Easy to rent. My brother and I were, uh, I mean, it, it was a wonderful experience because we met many wonderful people from all over so that we became quite cosmopolitan. We knew how to talk about New York and Boston and we knew uh, about art because many of them were artists, the te teachers and artists, and we learned a lot and we could drop names if, you know, that it was a lot of fun. And it was a lot of, of uh, it was interesting. It made the summers interesting for us. That's a good story. I'm very proud to tell you that story. Um, as, as a family, Aunt Ella went, my mother, my grandmother went, and then my mother was in charge of renting the camps and getting them ready. And we had one camp that um, had an outbuilding, and so we had put a bed in it and uh, made it a kind of little guest room. So it enhanced that particular rental. And uh, my mother uh, got word from somebody, and she would like to rent the camp. When she came, she was a lovely lady, and my mother installed her in that camp. And, she said she had a guest who would use the guest room. And we were thrilled, good, glad we did it, you know. So her guest was, as we used to say, a black man. And my mother didn't question it. And uh, we didn't really refer to it, but other people noticed. And uh, Mr. Dilly from up on Middle Road, who owned Highmark, got very upset about it, and he was a Washington resident. He called a meeting at the town hall and said, everybody who rents property in Chomark should come. So uh, everyone, quite a few people, uh, gathered. I remember being there. I was probably 12 or four, maybe 14. And um, so we're all, it used to be the top floor of the town hall. And that floor was a, like a stage and uh, was used for all kinds of public events. But anyway, he sat on the stage, very large man, sitting on a chair in the middle of a blank stage. And everyone came in and sat, and they pulled up chairs. And 
I can't tell you how many people were there. I don't remember that, but the room was full of people. And he started to talk, and he, his whole manner became aggressive and unpleasant, and he was not saying nice things at all and insinuating that renting to black people would destroy the value of property in Chilmark and no one would ever be able to rent again because people wouldn't come. And um, then he got, I don't even like to tell this, he, but, he got, but it really did happen. He started to tell a story. I lived in Washington, D.C., and we used to throw oranges to the little unfortunate children. And um, when he got to that, this silence fell. I mean, it was just deadly. And everybody got up very quietly and everybody left. Everybody. I, I was young, not so young, I didn't appreciate it. My mother was so happy because she just felt terrible. I had gone down with her to tell this poor woman that this meeting was going to be held. And, you know, my mother just apologized that I, I can't stop it, you know. But everybody just got up very well. Left him sitting on the stage talking about his oranges. Oh, I, we loved it. It was great. Many people never forgot it. Story. That's a great story because it really happened and it worked without sign carrying or, you know, nobody had to do anything. They made this statement. It was great.